Thanks, Matt. <laughs> Right, you ready to go, yeah? yeah. Okay, yeah. Right, e-commerce, pratfalls and pitfalls. Uh, I'm going to examine um, some of the problems that you'll get or might encounter when you're growing your online sales, when you go from one from a small shop to a large shop to a much larger retail outlet. I'll start by looking at an example of a pratfall. Now, um, I'll explain what pratfall is in a minute. I'll then use this to illustrate some of the pitfalls when scaling up. And finally, I'll, look, I'll end on a positive note on some of the things you can do that might help you scale up your business. Okay. So, a pratfall. <laughs> it's a humiliating failure. In England, we've got loads of phrases for this. To fall on one's arse. To fall arse over tit. There's, there's a whole host of phrases. But it's a humiliating blunder, it's a huge mistake that you've made. Now, I'm going to start with an example from a client, an ex-client I should have, um, <laughs> of their 2015 Black Friday sale. And I always like to use uh, American um, Family Guy, because I think it's a great American satire. What I didn't realise is, is they would actually go and end up electing this president. <laughs> But anyway, I was called in by this company. Um, they were having problems. They'd grown very rapidly. They were selling white goods, you know, kitchen stuff. Uh, they were using Magento, community edition. They had two sites, a small micro site, a niche site, and then the main site. And the main site was turning over about a million pounds a month. So they were growing very rapidly and the technology was creaking around the edges. Okay? Some things weren't quite working properly. So they brought me in to see, as a consultant, to see if I could help sort of iron some of the problems out. And also try and get on top of their marketing. Because they were spending an awful lot of money on Google AdWords in order to buy, they were buying traffic really. Um, so I came in, I had a quick look at the infrastructure, and I made a couple of suggestions. They had three PHP developers there. And when the company said, yeah, we're going to bring this guy in, two of them left. Because it was kind of an implicit criticism, I think, of the structure they, the infrastructure they had. Anyway, I come in about September 2015, and I said, well, what's the plans for Black Friday? He went, oh yeah, we're going to throw money at it. I said, okay, so who's in charge of the project? I what? What project? <laughs> okay, so there's no project then? No, no, no. So what's, what's the plan? We're going to throw money at it. Google Ads. We're going to take out loads of offline adverts in the local newspapers now. Okay, so, so what kind of traffic are we expecting? We'll be happy with 100% increase in sales. Okay, so how many sort of sales is that? Oh, it's about 300 orders over the weekend, so we're looking for 600 orders, something like that. Okay. Can our infrastructure cope? And the one that remained developed, yeah, I think so. I said, have you ever done any load testing? But they had done no low test. We didn't know whether it would cope. Okay, so that's my first concern. So we were expecting to 100% improvement, 100% more traffic. So double the users? Double, double the users. The traffic and the platform, the, the same? Yes, okay. they just expect a 100% ramp up. Okay. Yeah. And of course, if you do 100% more orders, that's not actually the traffic. The traffic is going to be a lot more than that because your CTR is what, 2 3%? So really, they're really looking at a lot more users coming in over this Black Friday period. And we were using at the time DigitalOcean, which was a fine platform. And we had like uh, two application servers, a, a database server, and a load balancer. And the idea was half go to one side, half go to the other. We didn't really know that worked that well in practice, and we'd never tested it, and we'd never, like I said, we'd never done load testing. And we were also, with DigitalOcean, you are totally self-managed. Now remember, we've only now got one developer left in the building. Um, and on the Monday before Black Friday, the week before Black Friday, he tells me he's on holiday over the whole Black Friday period. <laughs> 
Now, I'm getting a bit worried now, because we, we don't know whether the system will handle the load, and if it falls over, the one person who knows how to get it back together. It's on the beach. He's actually in Portugal. Oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So rock, he's rock climbing, and he's told me he's got limited uh, Wi-Fi. Basically, he's, he's off frame. He's off the uh, grid. So I get him to tell me all the passwords, and we try and work out how it all works. Like I say, on that Monday, he then goes on holiday. And I think, who let him go on holiday on the most important sales time of the year? On the Tuesday after he's gone on holiday, we find that on the micro site, the SSL certificate has run out. Expired. It's expired. <laughs> Nobody had thought to think about, there was no documentation anywhere which says, Oh, you need to renew the domain name by the first of X or something. And of course, we can't get hold of this guy, but I think, never mind, he's given us all the details. So I try an SSH in, and it's then I realise that only the root user has SSH access, and he wouldn't give us the root password because he says, I'm not a fool, I'm not going to let you guys have root access. So we can't renew the SSL certificate. We go to DigitalOcean, they say it's self managed, guys. It's your fault. You know, it's your responsibility. So we actually managed to get hold of this guy in Portugal through text messages and you know social media on the Wednesday. Okay, um, so we finally managed to get the SSL certificate in time, just in time for Black Friday. On Thursday, on the main site, and I'm, you know, like I say, I'm worried about this gig. Um, Google tell us that they're removing our Google certified shop status on our main site. This is Thursday afternoon, Black Friday tomorrow. So we have to remove all Google certified shop branding from the emails and the website, etc, etc, etc. But uh, I'm sorry, why did that happen? I, uh, yeah, Google, I don't know. When you're a Google certified shop, um, you're only allowed something like 1.5% of complaints oh. on, of the total order. So if it goes over a certain threshold, they will remove your Google status. So if, because when you're a Google Shop certified, Google sends you information saying how did that purchase go, etc, etc. Okay, okay, okay. And we had got up just over the threshold of complaints. So they removed it from us, just like that, on the eve of Black Friday. So how did you think it went? I would like oh, to say, it went really well. Yeah. <laughs> I was really, really nervous. And so on Friday, I'm logging in, but it was actually a huge success. In fact, Black Friday was so successful, we carried on the campaign on the Monday, on the Saturday and the Sunday. And we had a 400% sales of it. In those three days, we took over 400,000 pounds, all through one website, essentially, a Magento community website. So there I am, on the Monday I go in, and I'm there with a Google guy, I'm giving hands five, we've got a Google account. Yeah, yeah, it's great, isn't it? It's great. When I meet the owner, he's looking a bit ashen-faced. And I think, well, come on guys, we, we smashed expectations. What, what's gone wrong? And it's during the course of that Monday and the Tuesday and the Wednesday and the Thursday, we found that we had systems where we polled every three hours the suppliers' sites for status, stock status. Do we have, you know, you've got 10 in stock. Okay, we'll put 10 on our website and we'll sell them. We were going back to the supplier and saying, how many more can we have? Oh, you can have 20. And we put those extra 20 on our site. And we were selling them, because we were just doing, you know, we were smashing all our sales records. And also, we were telling customers, if it's in stock, we'll deliver it the next day. Okay? So you buy this washing machine from us, yeah, on Friday afternoon, we'll deliver it uh, Saturday evening. And it was all automated, so out went the emails and the text messages saying expect your delivery from, of your washing machine on Saturday afternoon or Sunday morning. But it all fell down because our suppliers were also telling other people they had tenant stock. And those other people were also selling those tenant stock. So the inventory was out of date almost as soon as we updated our website. So what was actually happening is we and loads of other websites were selling stock which didn't exist. And so 
our customers were getting an, uh, a text message saying it's coming on Sunday afternoon, stay in. And then nothing was happening and then Sunday afternoon we were going, oh sorry, it's a two week delay. Now, it's not so bad on a Sunday perhaps, but when people are taking time off work yeah. and things fail to turn up, people get angry and people so start to phone in. The customer start. support yeah. was really nice yeah. that day. And so Monday, Sunday and the Monday, the customer support people had been inundated with telephone calls saying, where's my washing machine? What's going to happen to it? Um, and the, one of the mistakes that was made was the customer support people, actually sales people, who were incentivized to sell. So when someone phones up to complain, they've got no incentive to deal with that complaint. They want to put the phone down as quickly as possible to pick up the phone to hopefully make a sale. So what was happening is we were having, we were inundated with telephone calls and sales guys were going, yeah, yeah, oh yeah, it's coming in tomorrow, putting the phone down, picking up the next one saying, can we sell you the washing machine? Oh no, you've got a complaint, have you? Okay. So people, like I say, our telephones were hammered. We didn't have enough salespeople on the phones to answer the phones. And the result of that was, what do you do when you can't get through on the telephone? So I'm, I'm sorry, so I guess this, this in this case, they didn't have, they didn't have uh, help desk support. No, so we're the, same. the people that are selling are the same that are support. So yes, yeah, that's bad. That's bad. Bad, bad planning. Bad planning. Guess, bad yeah. practice. Okay. Towards the end of the week, we actually got more telephone lines put in, and we actually then employed people primarily just to answer the telephone <laughs> customer support. But these were people who didn't know the business very well, so it was mistake on mistake on mistake. And of course, if you can't get through on the telephone, you go on Facebook, Twitter. We didn't have anyone monitoring our Facebook. This phone. looks like an avalanche with yeah. growing and growing yeah. the yeah. problems. Okay. It doesn't end yeah. well. Um, so our, our name was Mud then on Facebook, on Twitter. And I had to actually go and get an intern and say, look, there's the inventory system. Just answer every Facebook message, please. And say, sorry, Mr. Smith. Our new date is etc. Try and take those uh, complaints offline. Try and answer. We were just ignoring them. It was really quite disastrous. And although this is an extreme example, it really does illustrate some of the pitfalls that you can encounter when you go from a small e commerce site to a big e commerce site, particularly if you grow very quickly, as this company had. The company has recently ceased trading. So this Black Friday 2015 was the company's high water mark and in many respects it's been a gradual and inevitable decline ever since. Because once your reputation is damaged as severely as this company's was, it's very difficult to recover and very expensive. Right, a pitfall is a hidden or unsuspected. Some of these you could say weren't unsuspected. But if you've never been in the situation of having lots of sales before, you don't have the experience to know there are steps you should take and there are things you have to do to accommodate that extra growth. One of the difficulties you'll find as you begin to grow as a business, as you get more sales is, you end up having to adopt an omni-channel approach. And an omni-channel is effectively selling on multiple channels. Yeah. Yeah? you will end up having to engage or use an ERP, an enterprise resource planning, or an EPOS system. You might already have those in place. Okay? They also become a problem as you scale, or can become a problem as you scale. And finally, pricing can also become a problem when you scale. And I'll, explain, I'll go through each of these ones. Okay, let's like say omni-channel. It's when you're selling in various different channels. So you might have a website, you might sell on Amazon, eBay, uh, a CRM system, etc. And you might have also have a physical shop. So you're, you've got various different channels to sell. The problem is, it can be quite difficult to integrate omni-channel into your online presence. It's been, I've yet to come across a good open source shopping cart which does omni-channel really well. That aggregates all of them. 
the same. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Which gives you one point of um, control, so you can push all the products up to all the various channels and manage them effectively. Um, for example, Magento, uh, the main omni-channel extension is called M2EO, M2E Pro. Um, about, for about five years, uh, eBay actually owned Magento. And they pushed a bit of effort into getting the uh, channel integration between eBay and Magento fairly robust. And it's also reasonably robust with Amazon as well. But of course there are many other channels which Magento doesn't natively support. And I'm not sure there's a Juma shopping cart also that does omni-channel. Um, another issue is, and I'll build this in more detail on the next slide, but your EPOS, your electronic point of sale, can also have severe limitations, can really quite handicap a very fast expanding uh, online business. So let's have a look at ERP and EPOS. Now again, your ERP uh, encompasses things like inventory management, catalogue management, sometimes it's your shipping your, or your warehouse, uh, it could be your CRM, it could be the way you manage orders. So different ERPs take different um, or have different functionality. Some encapsulate all of it, some just focus on certain areas. Now, Integrating your ERP on your EPOS into your online shop is a consistent problem in my experience. Um, and it's something you're going to have to put a lot of thought and planning into when you des decide that you can no longer manage everything just through your J2 store or your Magento store. This is an area where you will have to put a lot of homework in and do a lot of testing. Um, not least because very often you'll find product definitions within the EPOS or the ERP do not match the product definitions of your online shop. Most online shops have simple products, you know, like a book is a simple product, and then they have products like a t-shirt, which is, you know, comes in different sizes and colours. I mean, I think JSTOR uses variables to describe those. Magenta uses configurable. Um, but I've seen CR, um, EPOS systems which can't handle configurable products. They can handle simple products, but the way they try to handle uh, configurable products won't work, doesn't work with Magento, for example. Um, and they've got no concept of bundled or grouped products, which Magento has. Um, and almost every client who brings me in, this is a sticking point. Um, even some of those like Bright Pearl, Linworks, which say they will work with Magento, they only support simple and configurable products. And sometimes they don't support those very well either. So, um, and uh, eSeller Pro, or which is now called Follow, which was like a, um, uh, an eBay channel, is now an omni channel piece of software. It has things called kits, which are really clever, which is the way of uh, when you've got products which are made up of very many different components which are shared across many products, it's able to take stuff off sale if you run out of components. So that's kind of the bundle, a different it, kind of bundle? Yes, yeah, a yes. different kind of bundle, bundle yes. Okay, so yeah. components which is sells in one, if I'm guessing there's another one that uses that same one? Yes, okay, okay. think of a sofa. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You've got a three seater sofa, the left and the right corners. The bit in the middle, okay, is the sectional bit, and that can be used on a four seater sofa. You oh, just okay. need two of okay. them. Okay. Yeah? So on a five seater you need three. Yeah. But it's clever enough to say when you've only got two of those central pieces in stock, you don't sell the five seater. Okay. You can sell the three, the four and the three yes, seater. Yes, yeah? yes, nice. Um, Stock is also complicated, particularly when you're in an omni-channel environment. Um, because one of my clients, they sell on eBay, they sell on Amazon, etc. And what they do is they do pricing based on stock levels. So when they've got a lot of stock on a certain channel, they reduce the price. And when they've got less stock, the price rises. Um, which is fine. 
but you need a way of managing the channel, all of the inventory in the channels and making sure it's in sync with what you've actually got in the warehouse. Um, and that becomes very, very complicated. Uh, and that's the example we saw on the Black Friday, is we thought we had stock sorted. Uh, we thought what we were getting from the supplier was actually a true state of, this, of their warehouse. As we found out, it wasn't at all. So you've got to be really careful the way you do stock, whether you manage, you have a central pool of stock, and then you just let each channel take from the central pool as and when required. So when you sell one on eBay, it just pulls it out of the stock. Or whether, like I say, on certain of my clients, they have to have a certain number of products in the eBay channel so they can do their differential pricing based on volume. Returns are also complicated. Yeah? When you're only doing 10 or 15 orders a day, it's something where you can keep on top of it. Yeah, you just pack them up, send them off, it comes back in, you look at it, you go, okay, yeah, we can resell it, and it goes back into stock. So Magento is really, it just says it has one state of return. When you do a, a refund in Magento, it says, do you want to put this back in stock or not? What happens to it if you do not? There's no record of it. And if you're not, yeah, it's just, it's just there. It's, it's in the there. warehouse. Okay, it's there. And one of my clients would do quarterly stock control, stock takes in the warehouse. And they found £100,000 worth of stuff which had just been not put back in stock. Some of it was damaged. Yeah, so what do you do with the damaged stuff? Okay, you might send it back to the supplier. Depends on when it was damaged and how it was damaged. So it's quite a complicated process. Um, and as you scale, when you get to $300 a day, $500 a day, it's much more difficult just to say, okay, yeah, to do it manually. Like you need systems, these systems to integrate. Pricing also becomes more difficult, funny enough, the bigger you become, or can become more difficult. What well, it's getting increasingly difficult to actually compete on price in many sectors on the internet. And that's because what the internet has done is it's squashed the margins between what you can sell something online and what you can sell it at a price physically in a retail shop. So most of my customers, they actually have a, a physical retail shop. And you'll now find they are selling, say this, the same price online as it is if you go into the shop. And that's because the margins have been reduced. So they've got less uh, difference pricing between what's online and what's in the shop. They've got less freedom, if you like, to set prices because the margins have been squeezed so much by the internet. So that's one problem you have. The second problem you have when you talk about price, if you compete on price, what you'll find is your competitors are crawling your site all the time. So if that's your only way of competing, they'll crawl your site and they will reduce their prices accordingly. So one of my clients, they used to, on Friday, crawl their top five competitors, find out what their prices were, then update their price to make it a penny cheaper. So when you landed on their product page, it would say, our product is cheaper than the top five competitors. And it also influenced their Google bidding process and their Google product ads. Because they like to say, look, we are cheaper. So when you looked at the product feed, it was a penny cheaper. And then on Monday they'd reset the prices because most of their sales were done over the weekend. But of course, the competitors would then crawl it on a Friday night and you've got this cat and mouse game of the crawlers. It's yeah, a, it's, a it's a continual yeah, yeah, yeah. circle, setting prices, setting prices. And again, it depends partly on your margin. So there were various business rules about how much we could reduce a particular product for a particular uh, period of time. Another reason why pricing becomes uh, more difficult is the brands don't particularly like it. Um, for example, if you're BMW, you don't particularly want someone selling an Audi for the same price as a Skoda. Even though effectively some of them are the same cars more or less, same engine, same chassis, etc. Because you've invested a lot of time, effort and money posi positioning your brand yeah. at a particular price point. Yeah. In an upper level. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't want one of your retailers cheapening the brand. 
So you'll find that some of the crawlers on your site are actually the brands. They're trying to police you. Um, of course, one way to get, to get around that is to keep the prices whatever it is and then offer a discount at the checkout. That's harder for the brands and the police, but they try it. They have mystery shoppers who will go through and try and find out what you're actually selling the product for. And as you get bigger and you sell more, you, get, you come under more in, in scrutiny by the brands. So when you are selling a million pounds a month or whatever, You'll have, an eight, you'll have a, a dedicated sales guy from the brand. Really? Yeah. And they will come along and they'll sit and they'll help you out and they'll try and police what your pricing strategy is. So the brands will police you. Um, they will help you, but part of their goal is actually to keep some kind of control. Yeah, helping, helping, helping them. Yes, exactly. Yes. I've got another little story. Um, there is a we were selling certain products, one of the kinds, and a certain German brand um, likes to see its product on the high street because it's trying to capture mind share. So it likes the fact that when you go down the high street, there are still shops which has its product in the window. But the people who were selling phys the physical retailers were complaining that there was one particular website in the UK which was undercutting them. And it was an internet only retailer. And so the brand said to that internet retailer, we are going to stop supplying you with our product unless you raise your prices so that it's more in comparison to what the physical shops are selling it at. So they were willing to cut their supply to the largest online retailer in the UK in order to protect the brand, the guys on the high street. Because for them it was crucially important that when you walk down the high street you saw their brand in a shop window. So that's how um, the brands help to police you in some respects. And the bigger you get, you become, the more scrutiny you receive from the brands. But one of the things, one of the benefits though is that Uh, the brand starts to do audits on your site um, and they, like I say, the sales guys will come down and they'll sit with you and they'll go through your site and they'll say these are the areas you can improve your customer experience. This is what I look at now, this is the, this is the positive takeaway from this. So the brands will audit your site, yeah? And what this enables you to do then is rather than just competing on price, it enables you to start to begin to compete on customer experience. If you, it enables you to begin to think about making your customer experience the best possible experience there is, so that people then, rather than just compete, uh, buying on price, they buy on the fact that they're getting the best possible experience on your site as opposed to a competitor site. And we had four or five orders from the big brands on a couple of these sites. And this is what customers like. And these are things you can do now which will help, hopefully, your site to sell more so you get to a situation where you encounter all these problems. The first thing is, and it sounds obvious, but it's customers like big, bold images. Clear, good quality images. Google product likes the images to be isolated. Yeah, on a white background. Okay. Because Google product will often reject if there's extraneous noise in the background. So a nice big bright image, yeah, for the main product image. And if you know if you're selling things like Hot Point, they will provide you all the assets. That's another nice thing about when you're one of the bigger brand uh, retailers is they they give you most of what you need in terms of images, etc., etc. The next thing you can do on page is gallery images, more images. Again, customers like to see more images. Because um, really, when you're selling a washing machine, you're selling a white box. Yeah. yeah? The same with a, um, a dishwasher, for example. It's a white box or a silver box. So what you tend to find, we have an example here, is they will put the white box in a very lovely kitchen. So you'll see the product in an aspirational situation. 
So the people go, oh yeah, my kitchen might look nice like that when I have this white box rather than the white box I'm getting rid of. Yeah. Um, also, it's good if you've got it in stock and you offer something like next free next day delivery, get it nice and clear. Just make sure you've got it in stock when you promise it. Yeah. This is becoming increasingly um, important, product videos. Again, as you can see here, this is a hot point example. They provide the videos. Okay. Um, also, I'm beginning to see on other retailer sites, customer videos, where people are using their phone and they're saying, oh look, here's my dishwasher. I put the pl dirty plate in, I turn it on, I pull the dirty plate out, it's clean. Yeah? Um, reviews. Yeah. Um, again, that's, it's about reassurance. That's good and bad sometimes. Yes. A bad review. Right. That's like, uh, yeah. But what you'll find is a lot of these review sites, when you sign up and you pay your whatever it is every month, uh, they'll aggregate the product reviews. So if you haven't sold any of this particular product on your site, what you're actually seeing is the reviews from all their customers for that particular product. And you can, be, you can filter by stars. So as a retailer, you're able to say, first five must be positive, of four or above or whatever. Yeah, there are ways around. This. Okay. Um, what they won't aggregate, obviously, is you also get um, retailer reviews. But again, if you've got really positive retailer reviews, add those onto the product page as well, or on the footer or something, as a way of reassuring customers. Because you've paid good money to get them onto your product page, what you need to do then is maximise the opportunities to turn those viewers into buyers. Another important thing is engaging product descriptions. Um, one of the mistakes I often see, particularly with new shops, is they're using the suppliers descriptions, product descriptions, which means you're just the same as every other site on the web. On the web. So you are, you are advising to rewrite this re specifications yes. according to us? If not necessarily the specifications because yeah, you know, it's got, what, the yeah, height is the height. Yeah. The first, that, the yeah, first. Exactly, that one there, that the first okay. paragraph. That's your chance to provide original copy. Yeah. It's also your chance to um, try and develop or project your brand identity. What makes you different from the other site which is selling exactly the same product for exactly the same price? Okay. Um, some people go quirky, some people go humour, other people go helpful. Um, personally, I would begin to start putting questions in there and answers. So the product description also becomes like a QA. Where does this, is this a green washing machine? Yes, the ratings are whatever. Um, so helpful answers to some of the common questions. And that will help differentiate your content from those of your competitors. And Google will like you more because of it. One call to action on a page. Okay. Just one. Just one. That's, that's my golden rule. Uh, this is from the uh, Magento stock demo. Okay. And so it's a, it's a top. And then it's a configurable product, so you can choose the, the color and the size. So it could be a t shirt, yeah? And then you've got a lovely big add to cart button. And then they've gone and added an extra five clicks for the user to do. To me, that's five too many. Okay. Particularly in this case, because in Magento, add to wish list, you have to be a registered customer to do that. So if I'm a first time visitor, why show it to me? Okay. Okay. Uh, add to compare up here. People have already done the comparisons before they land on your site. They've done the product research on the whole before they land on your site. So what are they going to compare it to? They're already, they've already made a comparison. Okay, so to me, that's, that's a superfluous button. Uh, this one here is the uh, email friend. Again, you have to be a registered user. Why show it? And then Facebook the tweet. Who gives up? You know, I want them to add to cart. Okay? So for me, 
I would get rid of this bit down here. Okay. Just make it really, really clear and simple. Um, this is one I lost. Again, on this example, we've got rid of all the extraneous clicks, except for this click and collect. What's the, the click and collect? Yeah, to me, that's a delivery option. Put that in the, yeah, the idea is, oh, it's uh, buy it online and then go to the oh, shop and collect okay, it. okay, yeah? okay, okay, okay. To me, that's a delivery option. Put it in the checkout. Yeah, okay. Do not confuse the user, because you didn't know what to I do, yes. It yeah. Was, yeah. It's pretty obvious, add to basket. Yeah. Yeah, at this point in time, you should not be presenting the user with anything which isn't clear. They don't, you don't need questions at this point. I want you to click add to basket. And then whether you're going to pick it up or we're going to send it, that's a, that's a checkout question. So, remove clutter as much as possible. Yeah? Just the one button, add to basket, add to cart, whatever the local phraseology is. So, to recap, scaling your business, when you move from 3,000 products, uh, pounds a month to say ten thousand pounds a month that pings problems it's great that you're growing the business but at some point you're going to have to in integrate other technologies other platforms other aspects of the system into it okay it's like I had a client who had a an ERP which didn't talk to the website at all so what they had to do it was manual yeah it, every time they got every time they got a sale of the web so they had to enter that sale into the RP, otherwise their stock was out of sync. Um, now I took him from three to 15,000 orders, at which point he couldn't cope. 15,000 pounds a month, sorry. So he got rid of me because he said, I, I, can't, I can't manually process the amount of orders. So I've got a guy now who's spending all day re-keying these. So I went, okay, let me have a chat with the people who developed the system. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna make it, um, you know, web services. In about 18 months. So, um, scaling up, you're going to have problems. That's why it's the importance of planning. And it's not just planning about this, the software that you're using, it's the things like telephone support, making it someone's job to look after social media, etc. Um, ERP is difficult, and you're going to spend a lot of time getting the right ERP system. And you might find you go through two or three as you grow. Um, but where you can do something really positive right now is on your own websites, on the product pages and on the shopping cart, is to make these the best possible experience that the user can have. And that will help you grow your business. Okay, thanks very much. Yeah. Yay. Yay.